Welcome to part two of Elden Ring's complete history. Today, we're going back as far as possible to the very origins and definitions of life in the lands between. Before there was intelligence, civilization, or faith of any kind in this world, there was the Crucible. But beyond the Crucible, we learn of a few other forms of life, including artificial life and life in the stars. Today, we'll explore them all. The Crucible is described in two significant ways. The Primordial Crucible, where all life was once blended together, and the Ur Tree in its primordial form. While there are plenty of smaller niche details and connections to other groups and characters, the vital details are as follows. The origin of most, if not all, life in Elden Ring is the Crucible, and the Crucible eventually transformed into the Ur Tree. Precisely what the Crucible looked like is difficult to determine. However, Siluria's tree reads that the primordial form of the Ur Tree is close in nature to life itself, and this spear, modeled on its crucible, is imbued with ancient holy essence. So, based on that description, the crucible may have been another tree similar to the Ur Tree, but covered in horns and antler-like growths. My wording here is intentional. We see at least one other instance of life conducing into a chaotic growth of horns, that being the ancestral spirits. The ancestral followers believed that the horns of a long-lived beast continue to bud like antlers, over and over again until the beast one day becomes an ancestral spirit. A number of new growths bud from the antler-like horns of the fallen king, each glowing with light. Thus does new life grow from death, and from death, one obtains power. The ancestral followers and the spirits they worship specifically exist outside the purview of the Ur Tree, but between them and a few other examples, we see a general rule set for how life functions in the lands between. Life is a power, a vital energy that combines, separates, grows, and withers over time. The Crucible may have been the melting pot of all this vital energy at one point, but over time that vital energy divided into individual life forms, and as those life forms lived and died, they altered the world and their surroundings forever. From death comes new life, not necessarily in the sense of reincarnation, but in the sense that all life is a part of this constant flow of causality, where death serves to spread those vital energies into their surroundings. In a less philosophical vein, the game provides a few examples of the Crucible's power and the concepts it's associated with. Chaotic, unexpected growths, like fangs, horns, and knots, are often seen as aspects of the Crucible, alongside wings, tails, and claws. The Crucible Knights, a battalion of elite warriors who served the Elden Lord Godfrey, each wielded these aspects of the Crucible freely behind their leaders Ordovus and Siluria. Ordovus and Siluria are both named after ancient periods in Earth's history, the Ordovician and Silurian, respectively. These knights were dressed in bronze armor and wielded bronze weapons, described as red-tinted gold in-game the same hue as the Crucible's own primordial gold. This red-tinted gold is an ancient divine energy, a wilder form of the divinity that the Ur Tree is blessed with. Beyond this, one other creation story is told to us from the biased view of the Three Fingers, envoys of the Frenzied Flame. As they speak through Hyeta, the Fingers tell us this. All that there is came from the One Great. Then came fractures, and births, and souls. But the greater will made a mistake. Torment, despair, affliction, every sin, every curse, every one born of the mistake. And so, what was borrowed must be returned, melted all away with the yellow chaos flame, until all is one again. This is a rather unique telling of the story, and one that part of me wants to dismiss. The Frenzied Flame is shown to use lies and deception to further its goals. However, considering these are the Three Fingers speaking directly, and not some of their messengers or followers, perhaps there's a seed of truth to this tale. For one thing, the One Great could simply be a term for the Crucible that better evokes the Frenzied Flame's end goal of returning all individuals to that singular birthplace. Some have suggested that the One Great is something larger, encompassing not just mortal life, but the outer gods and even the stars. However, I think Hyeta's following lines disprove this. She says that the Greater Will made a mistake, which suggests that the Greater Will is the force transforming this One Great into individual souls and lives. In other words, it seems that the Three Fingers believe the Greater Will is responsible for the Crucible dividing apart in the first place, and the torment and despair which followed. 
It is said that long ago, the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. The Greater Will, the Elden Beast, and the Golden Star walk into the lands between. But what does that mean? At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that another significant life form we have to discuss is the stars. The use of the term Golden Star is not coincidental, but related closely to stars in Elden Ring's universe. So let's explore them first. Unlike the stars in Our Night Sky, which are just balls of helium and fire, the stars of Elden Ring are living beings. Our chief evidence of this fact comes from Glenstone. If you've tried out sorcery in Elden Ring, and you really should, you're probably familiar with Glenstone, those multicolored crystals that power nearly all magical arts. Glenstone is described in a few ways. Starry Amber, according to the Rai Lucarian robe, and the Amber of the Cosmos, according to sorceress Selen. Selen also tells us that Glenstone sorcery is the study of the stars, and the life therein. In the universe of Elden Ring, the stars are living creatures, intense collections of vital energies, and when these stars die, those vital energies crystallize and fall to the lands between. Sometimes when these vital energies crash, they give rise to living beings, such as the Onyx and Alabaster Lords or the Falling Star Beasts. Other times, the stars themselves are the living beings, as appears to be the case with Astel. We often find these fallen stars in the depths of caverns, surrounded by smithing stones and their miners. This strange meteoric texture can also be seen in the Divine Towers, perhaps suggesting that these towers are hewn from stars themselves. Interestingly, these fallen stars and the stones that protrude from them are almost parasitic in nature. The workers who mine them acquire stone skin, as do the rare stone digger trolls found deep underground. These smithing stones are the very same as the ancient Dragonlord Placidisax's scales, with the difference that the Dragonlord's scales have the inherent ability to warp time around them. So, the stars are living beings, and when they die, their vital essence crystallizes and falls to the lands between as glenstone. The stars themselves often fall and give rise to smithing stones and living beings, and those smithing stones are the very same stones from which the ancient dragons were hewn. What exactly does that mean for the Golden Star? Well, it would be easy to deride the Golden Star as the surfboard the Elden Beast rode into town on, but that would ignore the essence of how stars function in Elden Ring, the fact that they are large bundles of vital energy. Based on our understanding of stars and the claims of the Three Fingers through Hyetta, I think it's far more likely that the Golden Star is the power we call the Crucible, from which all life in the world springs. This might also pin the Ancient Dragons as one of Elden Ring's earliest life forms, given their organic proximity to the very matter of stars. If you're still on the fence about this, then consider the fact that runes, the vital essence of life dropped by all creatures in the lands between, are also the building blocks of the Elden Ring, a power intrinsically tied to the Greater Will. If this really was the doing of that Golden God, then that means the Greater Will seeded almost all life in the Lands Between so that it could order and organize that life through its vassal, the Elden Beast. This question of chaos, order, and civilization will come into play in our next video on the prehistoric civilizations of the Lands Between, but for now, this is the theory I primarily ascribe to. There's one final form of life we find across the Lands Between that's worth discussing, because these life forms inform much of our concept of life and death in this world. These are, of course, the multitude of artificial and inorganic life forms we find in the game. A few simple examples of artificial life forms include the Albinorix, the Living Jars, and the Puppets, and in some cases, the Sorcerers of Elden Ring. Admittedly, each of these are a case-by-case -case basis, but they all follow a basic set of rules and logic. The Living Jars can be examined right alongside the Graven Masses, hence why both are found in Rai Lucaria, the aforementioned Ancestral Spirits, and even us, the Tarnished. These are all examples of individual creatures which accumulate fractions of vital energy within them to create a more complete final product. In the Living Jars, we have pots filled with organs and living matter which animate on their own. In the Graven Masses, we have countless stone-headed sorcerers stitched together to become the living seedbeds of stars. In the Ancestral Spirits, the vital energies of dead creatures gather within the horns of fallen kings, producing countless antler-like buds. 
And in the Tarnished, we have runes, the raw power of life itself, being transfigured into strength by a finger maiden. So, as a rule in Elden Ring, a creature's living energy is not expended or lost upon its death. Rather, that vital energy is often conjoined with other vital energies to form a single greater life form, something we find as a constant in this universe. This universal rule that life is either sacrificed or consumed plays a vital role in the mentality of one of our central figures, that being Queen Merica. Hear me, demigods. My children, beloved, make of thyselves that which he desire. Be it a lord, be it a god, but should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. Indeed, Merica tells her children to either live and make their mark on the world or die on the journey to someone else's glory. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. There's more to say on the other forms of artificial life, in particular the Silver Tears and the Albanorix. I'll touch on them in greater detail later on, particularly when we explore the Eternal Cities and the Nox, but for now, the necessary information is as follows. Both Silver Tears and Albanorix are artificial life forms created by men, the former by the Nox and the latter by an unknown party. As such, the Albanorix are detested by many in the lands between, sorcerers and knights of the Cuckoo in particular. As a rule, sorcerers consider the body a transient thing, transferring their soul to Glintstone and allowing that glenstone to flit between bodies freely. So the concept of a creature that lives a life entirely localized within a single physical body is probably a little off-putting. The Knights of the Cuckoo do declare, Behold thy defiled blood, unlike any humor that flows in our grand realm. This sort of artificial life flies in the face of the aforementioned rules we've discussed. Although the Albanorix we fight in-game still drop runes like any other enemy, Lore-wise, they likely do not contribute appropriately to the cycle of life, death, and rebirth we find in almost every other aspect of Elden Ring's lore. Creatures animated by artificial life are one thing, a natural endpoint for the predetermined laws of life and death. Creatures animated by nothing besides a mysterious arcane power are something else entirely. And later on, when we talk about Deathroot and those who live in death, you'll see how this gets totally upended by the time of the Shattering. So, with all that said and done, we have our first point in the Elden Ring timeline complete, that being the Crucible and the Origins of Life. Now, if you disagree that the Greater Will sent the Crucible alongside the Elden Beast, that's fine, the game never explicitly states that to be the case. However, I think I've put together a pretty strong argument for why that is very likely to be the case. All in all, it'll be very important to keep in mind these rules of life that we've set down because they inform the decisions of every single civilization that we are about to talk about in our next Elden Ring history video.